The lack of production from Ollie Gordon is definitely concerning, but the massive production and the Tulsa domination by Casey Dunn was definitely encouraging. You are locked on Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by to make this your first listen. We're available on all of your podcasting platforms, visually as well on YouTube. Find me personally on X at Old Deo State. Today, we're partially brought to you by Five Hour Energy. Go to fivehourenergy.com and use the promo code locked on CFB to receive 20% off your order with five hour energy. Get the best pick me up in the game. If you need to pick me up after watching the Tulsa ball game, well, it came by a surprising way, aka Casey Dunn was able to let the Alan Bowman show fully display what was possible. And of course, we knew that there were some limitations from Tulsa that we needed to take advantage of. We knew that there were some limitations against Arkansas that we didn't take advantage of. So this was a very encouraging sign from Casey Dunn. Not only that, we all have to admit that Casey Dunn didn't just run uh, an average, you know, sort of typical offense. He was innovative. He was creative. We had a couple unique kind of trick plays built in there. We had some route concepts that were unusual. I'm assuming maybe this is something that we were trying to save for Utah, but you have to open up the offense whenever you're having such a difficult time at running the football, which we will cover. But why not get bogged down in the good stuff, which was that game basically from beginning to end, including getting some of the backups in there. Oklahoma State was in control of that game and never really looked back. Although Alan Bowman did have the Allen back foot upgraded from Crawdaddy Bowman interception. Other than that, he had a very fine day, 24 of 31 for 396 yards, five touchdowns, and of course the one pick that was a little bit ugly, but you'll take it in a performance like that. Rushing, uh, Ollie Gordon, 17 carries at four point, or sorry, 41 yards at 2.4 yards per clip. BP got a, in on the action, one carry, 22 yards. Uh, Garrett Rangel, obviously, whenever he went in, he was able to break off a couple nice little runs. Ceci of Ayalaje was able to get in there for a touchdown as well. We did rush as a team for 129 yards with Trent Allen getting 53 yards off 10 carries for 5.3 yards per carry. But the real story is the wide receiver core. Dejon Stribling got loose seven catches, 174 yards, two touchdowns. The emergence of Talon Shetron in Tulsa, Oklahoma was very fun to see. 36.7 yards per completion with 110 yards off three grabs. Of course, the nice touchdown and the 78-yard bomb. Brennan Presley, reliable as ever. Seven grabs, 46 yards with Shot Owens. Three more grabs, 43 yards. Josh Ford chips in a few more grabs, 33 yards, and a touchdown as well. Five total touchdowns by Allen Bowman is definitely worth its weight in gold. And then from a tackling perspective, guess who? Nick Martin and Trey Rucker show up carrying the heavy load with eight tackles for Nick, seven tackles for Trey. And then it was nice to see Jeff Robertson get in the mix a little bit more. Kobe Hilton, Cam Smith, Garrick Martin, Xavier Roth, Lyric Rawls, Iman Oates all had multiple tackles as well. So this was exactly what we needed to see. We needed to see a domination from the beginning to the end. There was a couple things in this game that were a little less than desired, but Nonetheless, you have to get the win. You have to put up those style of performances, and they equal good grades, right? Last week, we had some unfortunate grades to give out. This week, it is entirely different. You got to give the quarterback play an A-. minus. This could be an A+, plus, but Garrett Rangel missed a throw there on the red zone. Alan Bowman obviously had that pick uh, going off his back foot, so we'll give them an A- minus here. Running back, Trent Hallen had a nice day, but other than that, we were pretty bogged down once again. So running backs, I'd say give a D tight end. You see Josh Ford out there getting a touchdown. Uh, you see Tyler Foster out there, man in the middle at times and laying down some blocks. I give them a B plus. Fullback, same thing. It was better than last week. We did miss some blocks here and there, but overall we sprung some holes and we were able to keep Allen Bowman upright. That's a B there. O-line, you get a B, not in run protection but in pass pro you did absolutely phenomenal 
D line A, linebacker B plus, safety C plus, cornerback C, wide receiver A plus plus, coach Gundy A, Brian Nardo. You get a C plus, buddy. There's still some yardage out there that we probably shouldn't have given up. Casey Dunn, you get an A, sir. Coach Dickey, though. Wow. Oof. Coach Charlie Dickey. I don't know. Don't know what we're doing there. Special teams, all in all, pretty good. I say they'll get a B plus as well. This was the domination station that needed to roll through Tulsa to give everybody at least a semblance of the warm and fuzzy feeling as we do, in fact, get prepared for Utah, which I like to call this baby bedlam week because Utah does do everything in their power to be like OU, to talk like OU, to act like they're going to run the conference like OU. So, I mean, it's cute. But we're excited for this week. They barely beat Utah State. Not that Utah State is a bad ball club. But they did it with a second-string quarterback. It's still somewhat up in the air if we're going to see Cam Rising or not. We better see it because we don't want to hear any excuses in Cowboy country that if this game goes down to, you know, the wire and Utah loses with their second-string quarterback, it's ridiculous. But we had to see a multitude of things in this game. The one caveat here is, of course, Charlie Dickey. And that caveat is there's a massive differentiation between the run game and the pass protection. Pass protection against Arkansas was really pretty daggone good, but there were times, that even in pass pro, that we got dominated at the line of scrimmage. That wasn't the case. More often than not, against Tulsa, we were able to win at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball, which was part of the encouraging thing that we needed to see. It is discouraging to see the lack of production in the run game. But again, on the other side of the ball, O-line, D-line was the biggest difficulty coming into this game. And the defensive line controlled most everything from the outset. Justin Kirkland was very productive in his role, as was Colin Clay. On the outside, Julio Johnson was getting pressure. Deshaun Brown was getting pressure. Xavier Ross got in on the sack party. Amon Oates was all over the field. So, we were able to control the line of the scrimmage more often than not. Again, we did give up like 130-ish rushing yards, which we shouldn't do. But at the same time, some of that was chunk stuff in the fourth quarter. And that's on the second team. Second team, the depth that you need to have to win a Big 12 title needs to be showcased. I don't know that we absolutely did that against Tulsa. We showcased more than enough. We were able to take our foot off of the throttle somewhat early on. Alan Bowman had a good day. And we were able to get some of the, the backups in. Now, we do expect more out of the backups. And I think that Mike Gundy even mentioned that in his postgame press conference, that whenever you go in as a backup, the objective here is to have you function just like the first team. So if you can't function just like the first team, then you're not doing something right to get prepared for the games. But again, this had to be a time where we saw the second stream because last year we never got to see the second team. Every game was that close where we had to keep the starters in all the way throughout. The first two games of this season, much of the same. You knew you weren't going to get a big break against South Dakota State, nor were you going to get it against Arkansas, but the objective, I would imagine, would have been for either one of those games to get the backups in. You have to be playing good enough to get your backups in to really know where you kind of stand as a season. So we were able to do that in a domination game, 45-10. to 10. It was great to see the wide receivers run loose. It was great to see Casey Dunn make several adjustments and kind of add some wrinkles in the route trees and, and the hitch and the goes and things that were eye candy that we hadn't necessarily seen before to get more of these wide receivers running a wide open down the field. If you can take the top off of the coverage, then who cares if they load the box? Loading the box, it's, it's, it's a way to slow. Oklahoma State down. There is clearly a blueprint to beat the Cowboys. Not everybody in the country should be good enough to pull it off, but should we be slightly concerned that Tulsa was one of those teams that was good enough to essentially pull it off? Talk about that right around the five-hour energy turn. The Cardiac Cowboys kind of struck again, but... Uh, more often than not, the game was well under control, so you may not have needed a whole lot of it in your life. But this week is bound to be significantly more stressful as Utah tries to roll into the conference and be the little baby brother. They're beating their chest around, and they're going to need a lot of five-hour energy to make this trip. Maybe you don't need it as much, but whether you have a to-do list that you need to get knocked out with, it's your kids picking them up from school, and then you've got work, and then you want to 
try to forget about, you know, not having all the stress. Maybe you're trying to get a workout in and you need a little bit more pick me up, a little bit more motivation. Maybe you've got some cardiac cowboys to watch and you know how stressful it's going to be. If you're watching all of your favorite football games, you're wanting to stay up and watch the intensity. Five hour energy is the best shot to help you accomplish all of these things. Get in the zone with the five hour energy shot that gives you the feeling of alertness and energy you need to tackle everything. With zero sugar, it is a convenient, portable size, perfect pick me up that'll help you get all of your stuff done in the day. Five Hour Energy website has crazy flavors like watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and more. There's flavors for everyone, and you can try them all. You can even build your own pack with 12 to 24. You choose the flavors, and it's delivered right to your door. Mix and match to make it happen. If you go to 5hourenergy.com, that is the number 5hourenergy.com, you need to get some 5 Hour Energy products in you today. You can use a promo code locked on CFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used on other promotions. The code is not good on subscription orders. You need to go to 5hourenergy.com today. Again, that is 5hourenergy.com. Go there today to get hooked up with the best pick me up in the game five hour energy if you don't need a pick me up you might need to be picked up with the ollie gordon situation so this question was posed after the game by a multitude of people because it makes the most amount of sense how does trent hallen come in as a reserve and have far more production and success than ollie gordon did even on such a limited amount of carries. Well, I think if you go back and look, and this is predicated upon film, the biggest thing that made Ollie different than every other running back in the country last year was not only the patience, but his ability to jump cut and accelerate out of that jump cut due to patience. That's the difference, I think, between Ollie Gordon last year and Ollie Gordon this year. This last two games, not so much against South Dakota State, right? He did have 126 yards. It wasn't huge, fun, crazy, sexy chunk plays that he's typically known for. It was a a road grader style of game for him. And then against Arkansas, they did a beautiful job shutting him down. But some of that was frustration. You could read the frustration whenever he'd get up out of the bottom of a pile or he'd lay down a vicious block or he'd try to take somebody out on the sideline. You could see the frustration, and you could also see some of the guys like Alan Bowman after getting that stupid pistols firing in the coach's face flag. Immediately after that, Ollie almost mixed it up with some Arkansas players, so we had some offensive linemen and Alan Bowman happen to pull Ollie Gordon back. I think that was a sign of things to maybe come if he didn't have a breakout game against Tulsa, and once again, he did not. That is frustration. Right, You don't have to be a film junkie to see that there's a huge difference between Ollie Gordon's vision last season and this year. And he's, he seems to be pressing way too hard, and he's slamming into the hole instead of waiting on something to open up. That's what made Ollie so deadly, was he only needs a sliver of a hole. I mean, you heard people like Trent Allen and Ceci Valahi talking about this in the offseason. That what makes Ollie different than most everybody else is sometimes he can cut back and hit a hole that doesn't even look like it's there. Or he can anticipate a hole opening up. So he'll wait an extra split second, boom, jump cut, accelerate off that jump cut, and then you know you see what he can do. But he's slamming into the back of his own lineman and he's slamming into defensive tackles, which is uncharacteristic of him. That's not what Ollie was doing last year. He was finding the hole, you know, breaking a couple tackles after the line of scrimmage, and then he was busting loose. A significant amount of this definitely has to go on Coach Dickey. That is his bread and butter. And this is where it's frustrating for us as a fan base because Mike Gundy always talks about how if the team has a numerical advantage, you're kind of beating your head up against the wall trying to run into those numbers. So then I went back and watched 2011-2012 Kansas State where they had the same Charlie Dickey. And they were the, the, the epitome of getting a hat on a hat 
and you knew exactly what was coming, and you probably still couldn't stop it. So although Mike Gundy's certainly not wrong, if they're going to keep giving us numbers on the outside and you have wide receivers, several wide receivers that are going to have 100-yard days, I don't care, like I said in, in my tweet, if we have to go Talladega Knights four wide, if that's the answer, then okay, fine, that's the answer. But occasionally we have to be able to rely on Ollie Gordon to pop it, at least occasionally, to keep defenses honest. Because right now, of course, loading the box, stopping Ollie seems to be the blueprint to stop Oklahoma State, but it's not working. We're still winning. Our wide receivers are clearly better than most of the national punditry we're willing to talk about. But eventually, we do have to get Ollie out there to bust a few runs. Some of that is on him. Last year, this is the same O-line, the exact same O-line. There are zero differences other than the fact that Jason Queso Brooks, um, you know, is, is no longer in the building. So other than that, it's the exact same line. So how was he able to make holes last year that aren't there this year? Part of that is the patience. Ollie is getting frustrated, and it's causing him to lose some of that vision that allowed him to find little creases that most running backs didn't see. That's the, He's not seeing them this year. And of course, Charlie Dickey does have to do more because, again, Anybody who's who you know, reverts to the numbers thing, go back to 2012 K State. Teams were putting nine dudes in the box, and K State was still rushing the ball for three, four, five, six yards of carry. It didn't matter how many people they put in the box, they still were able to rush ridiculous amounts. I mean, the the John Hubert, the running back, I think he was a thousand yards or nine fifty, nine sixty. So it can be done. Look at Army. Look at Navy. There's games that they pop up and cause problems for top 25 teams all the time, not because they're vastly more talented, but because if you run an offense to perfection and every player hits the right defender at the right angle at the right time, there's naturally going to be holes that get opened up. So we're missing something. It's not just about getting a hat on a hat to the second level. I do think fullback is part of it. I like Jake Schultz, but Braden Cassidy was the reckless abandon, lay my body out. I don't care if I tear 73,000 ACLs guy. Braden Cassidy was that dude. And I think we are seeing that we do miss Braden Cassidy in that role. Again, not a knock on Schultz. He's a good fullback, converted defensive end. But being a defensive end, I would expect him to, at times, maybe have some of that reckless abandoned tenacity to help Ollie Gordon get sprung. Of course, some of Ollie Gordon's frustration is visible. If we can fix it for the Utah game, then this conversation doesn't even matter. But Utah probably does have enough guys to basically play some semblance of man-to-man -man without having to load the box up constantly. If they can, it could be a long day. Make them load the box, but even if they do load the box, find a way to utilize our tight ends and our fullbacks to get an extra hat to open up more holes. Because it is possible. Teams do it all the time with Nine men in the box, ten men in the box. There are several teams that still find ways to run the ball. And it's all just off of technique. They technically don't make mistakes. They don't shoot themselves in the foot. And every player knows what role they have and, and who to block. And So it's not easy. I understand. But it can be done. You don't want to keep beating your head against the wall on numerical disadvantages. But it does happen. There are teams that their whole offense is operated off of being in a disadvantaged type of situation and still getting it done. I'm not saying we go triple option, but, but it can it can be done. And Charlie Dickey needs to do more. That might allow Ollie to be more patient in the hole and see more things. Speaking of seeing more things, We've got an ad for you to see. 
It's money making season, and the Cowboys did cover. Thankfully, it, it was a good opportunity for you to capitalize. So here's another opportunity as we take on the Utah Utes. You know, this is the number one sports book in the country because FanDuel is the bee's knees. Right now, they're doing something a little bit different through September 22nd. All FanDuel customers can bet five bucks and get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. With the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you'll need is a Google account and a current form of payment. You can then cancel at any point in time. Make sure that you visit FanDuel.com to download the best in the game today, which is FanDuel. Download America's number one sports book. It's the early line on the Cowboys at two and a half. This is a good opportunity for you. To hammer the over on the Cowboys against the Utah Utes, a.k.a. the Bailey Baby Bedlamiers, because they're, they're trying. The pretentiousness, the obnoxiousness is upon us this week. That is Utah. And I, we call this Baby Bedlam Week because, you know, they have gone out of their way to try to talk like they run things and they're going to run things. And as much as we're going to spend this week talking trash on Utah, and we'll start with the fact that they barely beat Utah State after giving us a hard time for barely beating Arkansas. They have some limitations. But before we have a week of, you know, throwing shade and having fun, I will firmly say that I think everybody in Cowboy country hopes and prays that Cam Rising is healthy. Of course, it's bull crap that ESPN game day is going to go watch the fluff fest of Tennessee OU. The Josh Heupel story is the only thing that makes that intriguing, okay? But the SEC propaganda, they have something to push. We have something to push in Big 12 country. And Utah fans have been pushing that, that this is the game and they're the team to beat. And we should view that as disrespectful. We do respect their coach, Kyle Whittingham. We do respect Cam Rising. We do respect all of the winning that Utah was able to do in the Pac-12. And we respect the fact that they're in the conference because it does help with eyeballs. It does help with marketability. And this game is another one of those perception games for Oklahoma State and to some degree Utah. Kansas State is still going to be a major player in this conference race. I think Iowa State is too. UCF, you know, we were kind of curious as to what they would look like against what is typically a real defense in TCU, and they look kind of like the 2012 K-State ball teams, like the ones we were just talking about, that they could basically tell you the play, and they were still going to run it. They were going to get a hat on a hat. They were going to pull the guards. They were going to have the tight end scoot over and, it would be productive. That's kind of what UCF looks like. I still don't know that I'm a firm believer in K.J. Jefferson as an overall quarterback, but if you're talking about a triple option style of attack where you have basically four running backs, that's going to be really hard to, to stop. So UCF is going to be a problem, but this is the game that everybody outside of the Big 12 country circled. Oklahoma State, Utah. It is here. We hope that Cam Rising is as healthy as possible because not only do we want to win the game, right, at your best, but we also want to see where we stack up because I think Arkansas did show us that maybe we do have some limitations that we didn't know about or those limitations are on a, are on a much bigger scale. The Big 12 might be a little bit down this year, so these marquee games might not be as often. This is a game for Ollie Gordon to come out of his shell. This is a game where Utah might think that they can play man-to-man -man and stop Ollie without loading up the box. This might be a game where, um, you know, Isaac Wilson gets the nod. I hope not. I want to see a Cam Rising-led ball club coming to Stiller, Oklahoma. And for as much as we might hate Utah for that 60 minutes during the game, Outside of it, you're going to have a phenomenal trip to Stillwater because we're a very, you know, gracious, inviting host ball club. 
So before we raise the hate level, we'll take this time to say that it is awesome to have Utah in the league. It is awesome to have the eyeballs that will naturally be on this game in Stillwater. And we hope that you are fully healthy. I promise you, we do not want to beat a depleted Utah ball club. Not just because of, you know, the perception of it, but we want to be tested. The more you're tested in this conference, the more prepared you shall be for the CFP. We had to beat Arkansas. We had to beat South Dakota State. And we had to dominate Tulsa to make it look like there was a realistic picture for us in the CFP. That picture still exists. This is that next game that everybody's written down is problematic. So we want to beat a fully healthy Utah. So please be healthy. And please bring everybody that you can to experience Stoller, Oklahoma. Because again, outside of the bravado and the crap talk that is inevitable and likely and necessary, we are a very, we're a very interesting group when it comes to hosting teams for tailgates. There'll be a little, lot of love dispersed as much as uh, there will be a decent amount of hate. So we're here for it. You want to be baby Bedlam. So let's bring uh, the excitement of this week like it is Bedlam. So this will be the nice day. Take it for what you will. All right, y'all. I reckon that's all we're going to have for this one right here. And then we get to focus on Utah all week. How sweet it's going to be. As always, you know I love you. God bless. Go Pokes. Thank you for tuning in to make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State. You could be anywhere. So happy you choose to be here. Like it if you like the daggone thing. Dislike it if you don't. That's okay, too. More importantly, share, comment, and subscribe. My podcast and people out there. The bricks, the butter, the bread, the foundation, the fondue, the fountain, all of it. Do what you do. Hit the stars, leave a review. All righty, y'all. Later, my taters.